and, and this is sort of the manifestation of what Theodor Herzl, who himself was an atheistic, uh, uh, nominally a Jew, but he hated Jews. He hated he hated religion. He hated he hated the idea of God. But he was the guy who oversaw the the 1896 first Zionist Congress to try to say, oh, it is God's desire that the Jews be given the homeland that's there. That you know, so you very clearly. Um, geopolitical is not a religious issue per se and a lot of those people like i mentioned alfred milner lord alfred milner lord balfour these were two rabid pro-fascist anti-semites both they worked closely with prime minister lloyd george a rabid pro-nazi who want he was going to be the first choice for the nazi prime minister if the nazis should uh come out victorious in world war world war ii later on he was the guy, and all of them, they they, they hated Jews. They, they were occultists. They were Freemasonic occultists. That That's true. They were Satanists. That's true. Luciferians? But, like, yeah. Luciferians, okay. yes. Yeah. Um, but they also wanted this. They were so devoted to giving the Jews a homeland. No. No, they, they, what, what the, what Jerusalem always has been since the days of the Roman Empire has been a geopolitical pivot point around which the, the, various civilizations of the world intersect in a very specific zone africa um the chinese world india the 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 russian world europe all intersects in this zone and whoever could keep that destabilized is able to control what you know uh lord mackinder who was another high level fabian along with lord balfour called the world island whoever controls the world island controls the world and that zone is in the heart of Eurasia. And by keeping that destabilized, you control the world. Now, here's another thing. People say, oh, the Jews are behind everything. Look, look at Walter Rothschild. Rothschild money bought up a lot of the, the land in Palestine. And, and Walter Rothschild was there co-drafting the Balfour Accords. Yeah, but he never lived there. No Rothschild ever lived in Israel, why would you do that? The point of Israel is to keep constant turmoil for the purpose of geopolitical effects that you want to maintain. Matthew Eret, thanks so much for coming on my show again. Nice to see you, man. How are you? Hey, nice to see you too, Kayvon. It was a pleasure, and I, I'm, I'm sorry that I, I only have 30 minutes today, but we'll we'll make it dense and compact, so I'm sure people will get something good out of this, no matter what. That's perfect, man. No, I already figured out, you know, how many minutes like which we could uh, we should talk about. Okay, okay uh, so the first thing uh, it wasn't the article written by you, but um, it's but you posted it on CanadianPatriot.org on the British imperial roots of political um zionism now the the reason i think we should bring this up first is i think we there's so many fallacies and um taboos to be honest with you uh when it comes to the the topic of zionism and we never we never see orthodox or torah Ju judaism people protesting against against zionism whether that be in israel or iran or any other country is that a taboo topic, Matthew? <laughs> well, it's it's highly politically charged. You know, I think a lot of people um, they lack a sense of the they they don't understand the techniques used by empire and especially intelligence operations, which requires a, a, a sensitivity to epistemological warfare. That again, it, most people just haven't done the work, and so without that appreciation for epistemological warfare operations, both past and present, um, they they get very easily sucked into very simplistic uh, debates about what is this thing called Zionism, as if it's one single thing, um, and it's not. It's, it's, it's something much- Can you touch the substrate? Like, you know, beginning with the Belfort de Declaration, Rothschild, um, you know, the whole British imperial yeah. roots. I mean, for like, well, I think I think the first thing to keep in mind is that no, no particular nation on the world is one thing, um, whether you're dealing with the United States, France, Germany, Austria, China, Russia, is Israel, Palestine, there's there's there are multiple, um, often uh, incompatible dynamics shaping the various 
uh, characteristics of each nation. You've got fifth columnists, you've got deep state operations behind every, every nation has a problem with deep state operations. Um, and when you try to evaluate the causes of anything on, in the world, any anomaly, whether it's the war in Ukraine, the crisis in Taiwan, the issues of Azerbaijan and, uh, and Armenia, the danger of a disruption in Georgia, which is currently underway, there's another color revolution attempt. It's impossible. It's incompetent and impossible to get any sense of causality by myopically trying to dissect that region without a sense of the global dynamic, the, the context. So I think context, which is both spatial in terms of like the world today is one aspect, but also temporal in terms of the forces historically shaping the dynamic in which different regions of the world find themselves going through experiences. Israel is one example of an, like th this is an area where today I think you, you brought up this this thing that I republished on uh, the Canadian Patriot. It was written by Doug Shulik Miller. Doug Miller. They, yeah, Doug Miller. Uh, yeah. Doug Miller. Doug Shulik Miller. He's a uh, a friend of mine. He's a a he's a Jew himself, and he uh, uh, did a, a a very important deep dive into the differentiation between authentic what he what he would call religious Zionism um, and political Zionism. And he makes the point in this paper, he goes through a breakdown of Theodore Herzl, of the Rothschilds, Walter Rothschild, who was a co-writer of the Balfour Accords with Lord Balfour, as well as uh, Lord Milner, another uh, figure uh, who co- and I, there were four writers, four, four authors of the Balfour Accords that were published in 1917, um, towards the end of World War I which effectively was a, a British geopolitical statement of intent calling for a ethno-national homeland for the Jews of the world to all be assembled in one convenient area. Now, one thing that's very interesting about this British, and, and this is sort of the manifestation of what Theodore Herzl, who himself was an atheistic, uh, uh, nominally a Jew, but he hated Jews. He hated, he hated religion. He hated, he hated the idea of God. But he was the guy who oversaw the, the 1896 first Zionist Congress to try to say, oh, it is God's desire that the Jews be given the homeland that's there. The, you know. So you very clearly, um, geopolitical is not a religious issue per se. And a lot of those people, like I mentioned, Alfred Milner, Lord Alfred Milner, Lord Balfour. These were two rabid pro-fascist anti-Semites. They worked closely with Prime Minister Lloyd George. A rabid pro-Nazi who want he was going to be the first choice for the Nazi prime minister if the Nazis should uh, come out victorious in World War World War II later on. He was the guy, and all of them they 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 hated Jews. They they were occultists. They were Freemasonic occultists. That that's true. They were Satanists. That's true. Luciferians, but, like yeah. Luciferians, okay. yes, yeah. Um, but they also wanted this. They were so devoted to giving the Jews a homeland. No. No, they they what what the what Jerusalem always has been since the days of the Roman Empire has been a geopolitical pivot point around which the the various civilizations of the world intersect in a very specific zone. Africa, um the Chinese world, India, the 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 Russian world, Europe all intersects in this zone. And whoever could keep that destabilized is able to control what you know, uh, Lord Mackinder, who was another high-level Fabian, along with Lord Balfour, called the World Island. Whoever controls the World Island controls the world. And that zone is in the heart of Eurasia. And by keeping that destabilized, you control the world. Now, here's another thing. People say, oh, the Jews are behind everything. Look, look at Walter Rothschild. Rothschild money bought up a lot of the, the land in Palestine. And, and Walter Rothschild was there co-drafting the Balfour Accords. Yeah, but he never lived there. No Rothschild ever lived in Israel. Why would you do that? The point of Israel is to keep constant turmoil for the purpose of geopolitical effects that you want to maintain. And so it's not like there aren't good Israelis because at the same time, you had people like um, Shalom Aleichem, you know, in the 1880s, 1890s, you had Shalom Aleichem, you, you had um, Yitzhak Peretz, who were these in 
uh, Jews who were trying to find a much more humanist moral foundation for the Jewish identity coming into the modern age of industrial scientific progress. And um, and there was a fight over what would be the Jewish identity. Now, this grouping represented the, the type of tradition that we had seen from people like um, Moses Mendelssohn, Moses Maimonides, uh, earlier Philo of Alexandria, the great rabbi who worked with the Christian uh, apostles like Peter in Rome fighting against the pagan cults and the mystery religions back in w- right when Christ had died. And these were groups who said, okay, look, if the Torah says that Jews are the chosen people, well, that means we must be um, the most responsible to be loving, good, reasonable beings made in the image of God. We can't, we can't, it, it was an, a non um, fascist. It was like a, it was a non fascist interpretation of that that said, okay, if you're, if you're the best, it means you've got to be the best in goodness. And if, if the Messiah is going to come, it's going to be because you've made the world just and peaceful so that the Messiah will want to come. Um, it was a very, and you had Christians as well, who also were looking at the Messiah coming back for the second time throughout the last 2000 years, who were, who had a very similar spirit. You know, the Augustinian Platonist Christians were like, okay, if, the end times doesn't mean the end of the world. There's certain language in the Bible that when translated could could be interpreted as the end times, or it could simply mean the end of an age, an end of an age of empire of injustice, and that it's our responsibility to bring about that city of God. And so this is where Augustine developed his doctrine of um, tolerance and cooperation with Jews and Muslims in, mm-hmm. in the, the end of the Roman Empire period or Western Roman Empire. That was a very important, um, some people attack it for being kind of racist because he used to still language implying that the Jews were, were, were of an inferior religion than the Christians. Of course he did. He was a, he was a Christian living in the fifth century. That's the, the, but the point is his doctrine of tolerance of the, what's called the doctrine of witness, meaning that he said, okay, well, rather than persecute the Jews and, and there was this, this ongoing, you know, back and forth Jews, attacking Christians, Christians attacking Jews, everybody attacking Muslims and Muslims attacking back. That that type of thing benefits only the imperialists who want to keep us at war with each other. And he said, no, let's have a new doctrine, which says that um, by, by protecting the Jews and maintaining them, Christ was a Jew. And so this, de- this demonstrates the validity of Christianity in Christ because the Jews exist. And, um, and there was a similar doctrine for the Muslims as well, that we all come from Abraham. We're all Abrahamic faiths and so we should all work together and that was something that gave rise to peace processes like um what we saw with the harun al-rashid you know who's during the 7 790 period 800 early early 9th century was the leader of the abbasid dynasty of the muslim world and you had at the same time you had charlemagne run, uh, at the helm of the the christian carolingian world which is pretty much all of europe today there weren't European na- nations. It was one dynasty, one one empire of, under Charlemagne, the Christian world. And then you had, at the same time, commerce going through both nations together, tr- the, the sharing of skills, the sharing of goods, trade. But that was made possible by the revival of the Silk Road. The Tang dynasty that had emerged onto the scene in 618 re- recreated the Silk Road. And so you had the rebirth of the, the commercial corridors, one of which stretched in the north through today's Russia. And, and there was a zone that was strategically important that became a Jewish kingdom. It was a Turkic kingdom that that uh, became Jewish around the same time in 760, 760 AD. And that played a very important role in these Renaissance dynamics of cooperation called Khazaria. Khazari, no, uh, finally. Okay. Because <laughs> I, yeah. I was constantly like trying to bring up this Khazari mafia. Now, okay, now, have you ever investigated, or your wife, Cynthia Chung, have you ever guys uh, written or invested? Because I've, I've, I've read a couple of articles about this, that it's sort of Khazar Mafia hijacked the tour, uh, the Jew, Judea, Judaism, and they are actually fake Jews, uh, you know, and, and especially within the state of Israel, the created, artificially created state of Israel. Is that true or? No. No, it's actually uh, in my research a, a very opposite picture has presented itself. In that okay. the uh, the the Khazars, when you look at their administration, and and there's been a concerted effort to destroy as m- much uh, firsthand accounts of Khazari. There there are some re- surviving accounts of people who lived during that time, 
a lot of Muslim historians and ge- geographers at the time were writing about this. Um, the Golden Bow is one really good uh, account of Khazaria uh, from a Muslim scholar. But what what we do know is that Khazaria was an area that was run by a king, Bulan, um, who did a conversion of the kingdom, um, who converted to Judaism. It's true. Now, the thing here is uh, the kingdom itself was run by a Supreme Court council of seven judges. And of it, the, the composition broke down to two judges were Christian, two judges would always be Muslim, two judges would be Jew, and one would be um, Greek pagan of some sort. You know, you saw the the uh, pre-Christian um, pagans that were still a factor in, in political life. So that, that was the composition of there. The other thing was <clears throat> they had no military to speak of. Harun al-Rashid actually provided, or maybe it was al-Mamun, his father, uh, provided the military, a Muslim army that would live in Khazaria and defend Khazaria under the one condition. They signed a contract that if Khazaria were ever responsible for a war against the Muslim world, then that Muslim army would turn against Khazaria. Um, that was a very, very important basis of trust building, right? It was both a balance of power, but also a, a trust building measure. And the Muslim world was a renaissance. It, it, I mean, they were going through an explosion during this period of growth, new discoveries, training of orphans, what are called the houses of wisdom in Baghdad and a variety of places around the Muslim world. That's where Jews and Christians and Muslims and Chinese scholars came to work on astronomy, poetry, the arts all together. Um, similar things were happening inside of, of uh, Charlemagne's kingdom too. Charlemagne actually gave, I think it was one of his daughters, um, to um, somebody from the house of David. Um, it was a deal brokered and that, that became the head of the southern kingdom of Narbonne. It was a Jewish kingdom inside of Charlemagne's Christian um, Europe, uh, which was a, a trade hub. It was a very important glo- global trade hub with material from Africa going through there from the Arab world. And uh, and the, the, there were the, the, the key... Um, the Jews played a key role in diplomacy in those days. So you had the the, the actual oligarchy that was trying to um, blow up the world back then, which is the same oligarchy and the same families and the same mystery cults that have been maybe rebranded a little bit in the modern age that are still there trying to blow up the world today. Same thing. It's not Kazaria. They basically turned Kazaria into a, a cartoonish thing that you would maybe think of coming out of Gerald Tolkien you know, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, Mordor, they basically created this like fictitious zone of evil just because it's evil. And there were just like Talmudic Jews who hated everybody and wanted to enslave everybody and wanted to kill everybody. And it's just this zone of evil. And if you walked in, you would become a slave. No, they, they created a cartoon, a cartoon image to absorb the hate, but basically project the, the superficial characteristics of evil, which the actual Venetian oligarchy embodied. So the head of the global slave trade in those days wasn't Kazaria, as we've been told. It was Venice managing global slave operations, including in the Muslim world. Um, it was the, the the Mongol hordes, which were sort of like a, a, pre, a prototype of uh, the modern ISIS groupings that emerged out of the, uh, uh, the most decadent, ignorant, Salafist ex- you know, interpretations of Islam um, that was brought to us by British intelligence, which is the the current incarnation of the Venetian operations of a thousand years ago that were using the these marcher lords like the Mongols to just destroy everything. All of the, the rivals, the rival states of Venice had to be destroyed and they would use the Mongols. That's what Marco Polo and his father were doing as advisors to the cons providing intelligence because venice was the global maritime center of control also of bullion trade everybody had to have uh venetian ducats it was sort of like a global um monetary unit and they had deep connections to corrupt operatives within the ottoman empire later on they they the vikings also it seems were also often in many cases uh, under the influence of Venetian intelligence operations. But these these things go back to families that 
were leading Roman empires, leading Roman senators, leading Roman priests who managed the mystery cults during Christianity and even before Christianity. That's the real center of this evil, evil parasite. And they've, they have found over the last 2000 plus years, a very convenient scapegoat that they've been using consistently and called the Jews. Because sometimes the thing with the Jews inside the Torah, there's, it doesn't say explicitly you're not allowed to like loan with interest. Whereas in the Christian world, the Muslim world, that's that's frowned upon. So if you want to be um, somebody who has the veneer of being Christian in a Christian dominated world, you need to do usury for economic warfare, but you can't do it in your own name. So what would happen, just like what would, what would happen under the Roman empires as well, you had the uh, the 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 court the the Hofjuden, the court Jews, certain certain Jewish uh, families who would be selected by the emperor or by the doge or the council of three or whatever to be a favorite. And you would be like a George Soros type of, um, we could almost call a, uh, a golem, a golem, somebody who would not be a golem is like a, you know, that, 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 that rabbinical occultist who, that yeah. story where he made a, a little clay figure and then had it serve him, but it then became a bit of a Frankenstein monster. Um, the, the Rothschilds, the Montefiori's, the Sassoon's were various uh, Jewish names, Jewish families that were given tasks to carry out economic warfare um, on behalf of their masters, but could never make policy. Mm -hmm. And so Kazaria was destroyed. Kazaria was the key, though, in, in stopping the Crusades from happening because it took another few hundred years for the Crusades to be successfully unleashed, which was... Christians killing Muslims, Muslims killing Christians. Um, Jews were always caught in the middle of that. The reason why they, it's not like they only tr started trying in the 11th century when it, when the first crusade was unleashed, they had already started trying to do that in the eighth century. And it was only because, you know, you had Charlemagne, uh, he was a, he had a diplomatic envoy uh, run by Jews and the Jews were the key dip, dip like the Radonite traders who managed the Silk Road corridors stretching from China all the way through through Europe through the Middle East um they spoke upwards of 13 14 languages each you know that that's what you had to be to be qualified as a, as a Radonite trader running, running the trading posts and they would be the envoys who would be able to uh, find ways to communicate between kingdoms and come out with arrangements agreements deals that would avoid war so one of the deals was Harun al-Rashid said before Charlemagne gets sucked into a, a war campaign to take back Jerusalem, I will. he sent um, an envoy with a giant elephant to Europe and gave the elephant to Charlemagne with a deed saying, here's a deed to Jerusalem. It's yours. And I will be the guardian. The Muslim world will guard it, but it will be yours so we don't have to fight. And Charlemagne loved the elephant. He rode the elephant for 20 years. It was a brilliant strategy brokered by the Jew, the Jewish diploma, uh, di diplomats that were connected to Kazaria. So Kazaria was a very important um, player in global peace and development at that time. And that's why they had to be destroyed. All memory of them had to be wiped out. There's very little today, which, like I said, has survived. And there were laws passed first by Venice, which created the ghettos. So the, the idea of the, the Jewish ghetto comes from Venice. That's a Venetian name for the place that the Jews were allowed to live in 980 AD. So Venice passed law saying, if you're a Jew, you have to like wear a star, live in the ghetto, and you're not allowed to access to, to find work. You're not allowed to work in guilds. You're not allowed to work in um, military affairs. You can't carry a weapon. You can't travel on ships. You, you can't do, you can't, at, at a certain point, you weren't allowed to do farming if you were a Jew. So the only thing Jews were allowed to do were like money lending for a, ma a patron or um, selling secondhand goods. That was it. And then these these Jewish anti Jewish laws were passed in um, in England. They were passed in Ger uh, in in the Holy Roman Empire. It became ubiquitous. So this is what created a climate of the the Jews losing their cultural excellence over over centuries of being sucked into these ghetto like systems, not having access to education. You're only allowed to read. Uh, the 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 Torah and maybe have the Talmud interpreted for you because what is the Talmud right there there's the Talmud is just a bunch of of books it's like what is it like six hundred different essays by various rabbis uh -huh. talking about how to interpret the Torah 
Okay, um, but the Talmud. I mean, because uh, there is a, obviously a valid and, and official translation of the Talmud, and uh, I mean, if it's true, then it's really horrendous. But because they are condoning the the rape of three year old children, is that? I mean, is that something you've you've delved into? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah, yeah. I have. So the the thing that Christians and Muslims have difficulty in understanding the Talmud is that when we have religious books in in the Christian world or in the Muslim world. Um, it's it's sort of seen as the word of God, right? The Quran, the, the Bible must be interpreted as the word of God. In the case of the Jews, the Torah is considered the word of God. That's what they consider the word, word right. of God. The Talmud is not considered the word of God. What the Talmud is, is it's an assembly, a hodgepodge of opinions of rabbis that were transcribed and published. That's all it is. Mm-hmm. And so part of the rabbinical schools, one of the, the positive practices is to try to strengthen the minds of the students by thinking, how would you formulate arguments to refute things that these different rabbis of the past had written and said about things? That's part of the schooling process. It's kind of dialectic. It's not just memorizing gospel and citing what what part of the Talmud uh, is what, you know? So there are when you... And I've not read the whole Talmud. Don't get me wrong. Like, it's huge. It's huge. There are uh, certain rabbis, a handful, maybe five or six, who are, I, in my view, satanic, really satanic. Mm-hmm. And they write toxic shit inside there, in their opinions. Now, there's also a lot of um, wisdom. Like, when you read other rabbis inside the Talmud, a lot of universal moral wisdom, right. life right. lessons, all sorts of good things I would say the majority of it is generally either just technical advice on how to interpret rituals of the Torah, of Leviticus and, and the Pentateuch, or good advice. And then you have spliced within it ignorant, toxic, satanic rabbis who put in their toxicity. How that survived, how that maintained itself, I have no idea. But most Jews will not resonate to that. You have to be part of like, a black magic occult uh, freak, <laughs> uh, which there are some in the Jewish, like there are Jewish. Where are they in, in Israel? I mean, where are they? I mean, globally? I mean, oh, I mean, uh, I, geographically, I don't know where geographically okay, they are, like, but I know in every like, religion, you know, you got like in, in Muslim, you got the, the Salafist Wahhabite right. um, interpretation of exactly. the Quran, a school mm-hmm. of interpretation, which tends to generate radical um mm-hmm. ISIS, ISIS fanatics, both or in earlier times, Muslim Brotherhood fanatics. Muslim Brotherhood was a faction of Islam that came out of the Salafist grouping, which was patronized by the British, by British Freemasonic uh, agencies in the 1920s, even earlier in the 1880s. Um, in Christianity, you know, you have like N- John, uh, John Nelson Darby, a, a British occultist, black magician who was masquerading as a priest who gave rise to like, you know, you've heard, heard you've heard of Christians talking about the pre-tribulation rapture uh, interpretation of, of revelation or Thessalonians. Um, that's Nelson Darby, the Darbyites that, that he created a, a sect called the, the, um, the Plymouth brethren first in Ireland in the 1820s. And that then migrated into um, the United States, into Mexico Alistair Crowley's parents were both Plymouth brethren. It was an a it was a satanic faction grouping masquerading as Christians, but with the right of initiation. And uh, this is where Crowley learned that he was the 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 great beast six six six. Right. So you have like all sorts of things like that, mm-hmm. you know, inside of every religion re- as repackaged, rebranded, um, Luciferian groupings that were pre Christian that will act like they're they're the representatives of whatever faith in order to create and carry out what becomes the effect of the crusades the murder and bloodbath of of people who have everything in common and every every motive to work together into a a a, a centuries-long killing campaign creating hostility bad blood and they did the same thing uh that's what's that's what's going on in the middle east over the last century and today Okay, let me. Uh, I don't want to cut you off because I know you don't have much time. You probably yeah, have only ten minutes. minutes. But can you like uh, transit? Because the the Jews of the Torah Judaism, they say you know, or constantly say 
we are against Zionism. We are against the state of Israel. There's nowhere does it say, you know, that there there's supposed to be a state of Israel. And with everything going on, you know, with the, with the you know people of Palestina, like you know, when you look at I don't know the map of 1947 or I don't know after the Second World War, and then it gets like <laughs> you see like a tiny spot left. I mean, can you transition to that uh, to Hamas, uh, Palestina, um, Israel? Uh, is it a false flag? Uh, uh, I mean, when you look at all the quotes yeah. and, uh, by by Met, 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 Metanyahu, Met, Metanyahu himself, I'm sorry, uh, Benjamin Met, Metanyahu, I mean, it's it's really scary. Uh, if yeah. um, can you just I don't know, can you transition a little bit and make a yeah, okay? Look, uh, it's it's a, it's a delicate one. I, I try to think, I, I try to put myself in the shoes of a Chinese diplomat or grand strategist or a Russian. Uh, diplomat, grand strategist. That's what I usually try to do. Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking, like, well, what are the what are the currents active within Israel that I could f- that that I could work with, and what are the crazy currents that I need to deamplify somehow? Now, the thing about Israel is, um, it's kind of like you're dealing with a, a, a psych case, like it's it's like a trauma case. They, they, there, there's a lot of trauma. And within that, you got groupings that uh, believe, for example, that we it's it's God's will that we we create an Armageddon so that the Messiah will come for the first time. There are factions who believe that. Um, they believe also in the greater Israel ideology that it's God's will that we have that Israel ultimately have control of most of Syria, Iraq, uh, Egypt, Jordan, all of that, Turkey, big chunk of Turkey. All of that is is somehow ordained to be the destiny of Israel's possessions, but to do that requires a total purging of all non-Jews from the land. Um, So some Israelis, and I think that the WikiLeaks recently in 2008 dumped a bunch of data, uh, a a bunch of um, emails uh, between Amos Yadlin, who is the major general in charge of a big chunk of the U.S. Israeli defense forces and the U.S. ambassador, Richard Jones. And in these these 2008 uh, leaks, it was revealed that is this this guy really wanted Hamas to become the dominant power representing uh, Gaza and the Palestinian Authority. He why did he want that? These were the more this was an outgrowth of the Muslim Brotherhood in 1987. Why would he want an outgrowth of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, to be the dominant political party, which they became? They became the dominant political party. They got exactly the Israelis got exactly what they desired. Why would they want that? Well, it, it's partially, I, I think that there is a faction that does want to amplify the violence to the point that it will justify a total cl- like purge and a war um, to fulfill their idea of prophecy, which is that a, 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 a last war does have to happen. That will involve the entire Arab world coming down on Israel. A lot of Israelis are going to be wiped out, but somehow the Messiah is going to come and make his chosen people live forever or something. Um, that's a crazy faction, which unfortunately is being used right now heavily. I think Netanyahu was sort of like on the fence, walking in both sides of the crazy world and towards a pro-Russia, pro-China development orientation at different times. But right now he's 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 profiled. His dad was the personal secretary for Jabotinsky, who was a greater Israel fanatic, um, somebody who was who was thought very much in very much in harmony with the Nazis in terms of an ethnic cleansed. Uh, religious like state of Israel where even today you know you can't marry if you're an Israeli you can't marry a Muslim uh, by law in Israel like w- what the hell is that so you see the, the the remnants of this racist garbage that are still there and so Israel Bibi is falling into his profile unfortunately I think Hamas is I'm not a fan generally I, I get the amount of injustice that's that's been suffered by the people of Palestine it's it's insane how bad it's been But Hamas, as an outgrowth of the Muslim Brotherhood, which itself is a creation of British intelligence and has been used, um, it's been used by British and Western intelligence providing support, um, including, you know, to to create chaos and to create and to disrupt any potential for, for example, right now, you have the normalization of of Israel. With Saudi Arabia, with UAE, exactly, with Egypt, yeah. Jordan, with a with a bunch of other countries. So, do you think uh, Iran? I mean, literally. I mean, seriously, because there's always constantly Iran, Iran, Iran. I mean, is Iran has been has Iran been funding the Hamas or what do you think? Oh, well, what's the role I of Iran? Know. I I don't know. I I don't know. What I've, about weapons? I mean, oh, who do you think? I, I don't know. Which, which nations or states do you think have been funding Hamas? My job 
because there's things I could I could say I have my opinions. I think it's likely that there's some there's some connection. Okay. I'm not saying, but it, it's not that it's not as strong as as people are trying to make it seem to be. Like when Lindsey Graham says, you know, we have to now strike Iran to it's, stop Hamas. Yes. I mean, these people really? not don't know what they're talking about. No, they don't know. What, he's he's making shit up. They've they've come out with a script that that Iran is the global uh, source of all terrorism. And it's like, no, there's actually no international court that has ever ruled that any terrorist case is caused by Iran. They're only speaking specifically about violence that has occurred through Hamas or Hezbollah and Israel. That's all that these these neocon idiot um, and neoliberal idiots in the West are thinking of. But Ron Paul did a really good intervention some years back where he he stood up in Congress and he went through how the actual sources of terrorism of Al Qaeda of ISIS is from the CIA's decision in the 1970s right. under Zbigniew Brzezinski to start funding radicalizing madrasas and he did an eloquent eloquent presentation that this is where it comes from it was a decision by the US State Department and CIA to radicalize young poor um, Muslim men in Afghanistan, but also Pakistan and other parts of the Muslim world under a Wahhabiite Salafist interpretation of the Quran and then be uh, weaponized to go to war effectively with the Russians as a proxy war in the Middle East, which is a big new called later on is his greatest success story, regardless of how many innocents had to die. So um, that's that's the only thing that I see as the cause of, of global terrorism is the patronage of MI6, of the CIA. And whether we're dealing with the white helmets in Syria, who are British intelligence providing support and logistics and other training to um, ISIS there, or Boko Haram getting its support from uh, different intelligence front groups in Mali or anywhere, it's 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 this Anglo-Venetian operation that ran the Crusades. It's directly tied to the same occult Freemasonic networks, pro pre pro uh, pre Freemasonic that launched the crusades that created the synthetic cults of the templars that were part of what made the crusades possible um as a ball baphomet worshiping sacrificing cult a sect that then transmogrified into the rosicrucian order that infiltrated the british courts in the 15th and 16th centuries that created anglicanism that that splintered christianity in order to break up any type of coalition of christian nations against the venetians in the 16th century that's what what, what that was all about that created the Jesuit operation in the 1530s. That was, again, a Venetian uh, orchestrated operation. Ignatius Loyola was in St. Mark's Square in Venice when he came through, when he was going on his pilgrimage to go to, back to the Holy Land. And it, he was facilitated by the Venetians, by the Doge whom he met. Um, yeah, the, the, the modern Freemasonic operations of the United Grand Lodge that was created in the early 18th century, its outgrowth of the Scottish Rite Freemasonic Lodges that were created um, in Scotland, but also in America in the early 19th century that then gave birth and gave rise to the KKK, the Confederacy, all of the, the most evil that was done in the world. The outgrowth of Benai Brith came out of this as well. Right. You know, I'm, These were all part of the same operation that's still there today that was trying to destroy the Jewish, the, 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 the 8th, 9th century Charlemagne, Khazaria, Muslim, Chinese alliance. For, for global progress, to create a, a city of God on earth, um, whereby the age of empire could finally be washed away. That's what, what is still active today. So I'll just end it there. That That's the key thing. All right. Global okay. dynamics are the key. Today, they want to stop the, the Silk Road, the, the process that China has led to normalize relations, both with Saudi Arabia, like I said, in Israel, but also with Saudi Arabia and Yemen, creating a peace process there, Saudi Arabia and Iran. Have had a peace process building up exactly. by Chinese. But it's all convenient timing, and it's no coincidence. Yeah. I mean, no, so no, no. What do you think? I mean, are we, are we seriously? I mean, if, if, if Iran gets involved, Iran is not what it used to be forty years ago. No, I no, mean, no. Technological, militarily, defense technology. I mean, they are really advanced, even in just the conventional military. If they, you know, if they provoke a war in the Middle East, maybe not a World War Three, but it's going to be a huge. No, no. I mean, it's going to be. It's, it's going to be so bad. It's going to be so bad. You can't even imagine. Um, and you have the U.S. USS uh, Carrier Group, the Gerald Ford uh, battle battleship that's going that's down in the mediterranean right now preparing for an attack probably on iran 
um, they want this. They want to escalate it because they want to kick over the chessboard. The whole Who game is board. They, is they like in the, the financier Bank oligarchy? Of said in one, banking city of London, or yeah, who, who the, are fin the, the, fin the financier? The financier oligarchy, the heirs of the Roman Empire that have been trying to create a one-world feudal state of depopulated uh, mind slaves for the past two thousand years. That same faction is still there today, dominating the royal hereditary bloodlines of Europe and also their, their fifth columnist deep state operation inside of America um, and Canada. That's the thing, that's the thing. They want global feudalism, and if they can't get it, they're willing to burn the earth to punish us so that we stop resisting. And that's what Russia, China are, and Iran and other BRICS plus nations are. That's why they hate them, because they're resisting. They're using the power of the, the sovereign nation state to bring about global cooperation amongst civilizational states for win-win cooperation which will that's the only way that the oligarchy will be wiped out culturally forever so that's what they want to destroy now they're they're freaking out they're nothing is working they're 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 gambit in the pacific and ukraine's not kind of working they're kicking over the game board and they're pushing for it so wiser heads have to prevail this this shit can go really bad really fast People got to be careful, but I got to go. I got to okay. go. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, from a zero to 10, like how, how grave is the situation right now? What is, would you say? I mean, is I it say like 9.3? Jesus Christ. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you Bye. so much, Matthew. I'll talk to you soon again. Bye. Say hi to Cynthia. Bye. I will.